All right. Here we are on uh, July 9th. Welcome to Stefan van Vliet, our uh, <laughs> famous our famous uh, beef researcher. Um, really looking forward to his his uh, report today on the um, all the metabolomics data, the nutrient levels data on all the beef we've been working on for the past three years with him in our beef nutrient density process. I think we may be getting a little bit of uh, information from him as well about um, was it uh, chicken and maybe pork and maybe some some of the human health uh, trials as well that are part of this. So very excited to hear this presentation and. I think we'll just let you take it away, Stefan. Great. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction, Dan. Let me uh, share my slides and uh, we'll jump right in. Great. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. You know, the title of my talk today will be uh, Linking Plant, Animal and Human Health in, in Livestock Systems. And uh, uh, metabolomics approach and I'll go into uh, what metabolomics is in, in, in a little bit but just to give you a little bit of a background on uh, on the interest of, uh, of of our lab so we have a particular interest in uh, work uh, that's being performed at the nexus of agriculture animal and human health and in other words if we uh, employ practices that potentially or farmers employ practices I should say uh, that improve soil health uh, does it have a trickle down effect on plant health and, and, and nutrient density of the crops, whether it's for direct human consumption or crops that go uh, into animals? Uh, does it improve animal health and nutrient density and subsequently uh, human health as well? Um, so it's defining these linkages. Does the more environmentally friendly or regenerative production principles also trickle down towards the nutrient quality of food and, and human health? And in, in that regard, we have two major interests, and that is... Uh, doing soil, plant, and animal uh, testing, animal source fruits testing, uh, to test the, the nutrient density in the case of soil, it so must be food, or it's, it's, you could argue it's food for the plant, uh, but to look at macro and, and, and minerals, in uh, macronutrients and minerals within the, within the soil. And then oftentimes we take those foods um, that we uh, gather and uh, from different production systems, such as grass-fed and grain-fed beef, regeneratively grown produce versus conventionally grown produce, and we feed these to people in our randomized controlled trials to determine potential health effects on, on, on human health. And what metabolomics really is, it, it's, it's a mass spec based technique. What mass spec uh, allows you to do is look at a broad number of compounds uh, uh, fairly precisely. Uh, you would use similar techniques, for instance, for, for drug testing in athletes. Uh, we don't use it for that, but we use it to look at, uh, at, at, at nutrient profiles within biological samples. And then uh, here's a picture of our, of our clinical space where, uh, where we run uh, clinical trials and, and, and do bug barrels of people after they've been uh, fed these foods. So why do we care? Well, we care because um, we're linking the fields of food production, uh, nutrition and, and population health. And then if we zoom out a little bit, uh, population is growing. We're trying to create a, a healthy, sustainable, and equitable future. Uh, food access, food availability is is, is very important. Um, and this comes back to that regenerative agriculture. While we often think about this in terms of, of, of soil health um, or, or human health or animal health, it is also very much uh, uh, rooted in, um, in, 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 in social structures as well, where we improve um, uh, as, uh, equity and, and availability to, uh, to, to foods as well. So if we look at, for instance, and this is from some, some work that we published in, in 2021, which was uh, uh, talking about current and future agroecological and socioeconomic issues, where we really went into, uh, in, into that, that topic, tying together the, the socioeconomic issues with, uh, uh, together with, uh, with, with agroecology, which is really wedding uh, the fields of ecology and, and, and farming. Um, and, and this is a sentence from, from, from that is, is that, you know, one thing that really surprised us and always still does, I mean, we can understand it, but sort of to read it through, nature has introduced great biodiversity into ecosystems, yet humans are adamant on, on simplifying production systems to, to single species of crops and animals in, in separate production systems that require considerable external fossil fuel inputs. If, if I look out my window now, I see some monocultures, but if I look in more, you know, 
natural systems. Uh, it's, it's rare to come across a monoculture, whether it be monocultures of plants or, or monocultures of animals. There's typically uh, diversity, and we see that this diversity strengthens not just soil health, it strengthens the plants, and also having multiple uh, herbivores within an ecosystem typically benefits that, uh, that ecosystem. So um, over time, I suspect that we will uh, move uh, more towards agroecosystems, so nature-based solutions, adaptive grazing, multi-species, integrated crop livestock where, where possible, uh, civil pastoralism, so this would be uh, uh, having animals, for instance, this is a perfect example, animals uh, grazing uh, a biodiverse pasture uh, in, an, in, a, in a forested environment. Uh, so it's understanding this relationship among soil, plant, uh, and animal and human health. And do we see this nutrient transfer across system? We, we often hear that the saying healthy soils equals healthy plants, equals healthy animals, equals healthy humans. Well, intuitively, that, of course, makes a lot of sense. Historically, there hasn't been a lot of data uh, uh, to, to suggest that, mainly, I think, because uh, and this, I think, so wonderful of recent times where, where, where farmers and uh, uh, academics and, and people in the medical field, uh, people in the social field are, are coming together to really look at this from more of a systems approach uh, rather than uh, uh, livestock scientists working on, 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 on something and then never really connecting with uh, uh, sort of the, the health or the human nutrition field. And I've noticed that is, is still in infancy, but it's, it's happening uh, increasingly um, over, over time. So this comes back to, let's jump into what, what metabolomics is, or what is the metabolome? The, the metabolome is basically the metabolites or the compounds that circulate in your blood, uh, or in this case, uh, in this case, your serum. Um, and there was a really nice study done uh, out of a group out of Israel, and uh, this was published in, uh, in, in, in 2020, um, as you can see here, uh, except it's September 9th. 29, 2020. And what they looked at is really what determines what circulates in the blood of humans. And they found that roughly about 50% what circulates in the blood of humans is directly determined by, by what we eat. So my grandma used to tell me, well, Stefan, you are what you eat. And, and I think all of her, you know, we all know this saying. Uh, it turns out she was half, half, half right. There's a half through to the saying, you are what you eat. So diet really impacts what circulates in our blood. So it's the biggest impact. Uh, and, and subsequently, that will obviously trickle down into our metabolism and, uh, and, and our health. So the metabolome is really the study of metabolites. If we look at these in the context of metabolites from plants, that could be vitamins, minerals, uh, uh, phytochemical antioxidants, such as polyphenols. If we look at it in the animal, this could be also, again, it upcycles vitamins, it upcycles minerals, it upcycles protein. These are all metabolites. And many of these metabolites can, can serve as nutrients to us, clearly, because half of it is about uh, what's, what circulates in our blood. And many of these are, are nutrients. So as a human, we are what we eat, at least half of what we are. Uh, and then the question is, am I what I ate as a, as a cow? Uh, because ultimately, uh, just another mammal, right? So if we look at sort of the, the work that, that, that we did over time in collaboration with the Bionutrient Institute, as well as from some, some USDA project uh, uh, or uh, USDA supported projects, uh, oftentimes involve on-farm sample collection where we uh, uh, collect forages or the farmers that participate in the projects collect forages, uh, representative of what the animals have access to. Um, oftentimes also do soil sample collection um, here on the left is a, a, a uh, Alan Franz Lubbers, who is a very uh, well-respected soil scientist collecting soil samples on one of the pastures. Um, we've had some side-by-side -side comparisons that I'll present later on, and, and this work is probably going to come out next year. Uh, we essentially studied these in, in, in southeastern uh, systems. What we did was we visited various grass-fed beef operations, uh, having biodiverse pastures, then we asked the farmer where is the nearest cornfield. Usually, it wasn't further than a mile. Uh, obviously, a good amount of this this corn uh, will go into the commodity market and end up as as livestock feed. So this was really a model. Of, okay, what if we grow feed for animals, uh, particularly corn, which is very common in the U.S. Or what if we uh, manage the field as a as as a pasture? What is the difference in in soil health? What is the difference in nutritional quality of, of, of these plants? And then what is the difference in nutritional quality of the meat that results from this? So here on the left, you see an example, total mixed ration sample uh, consisting of, of corn and, and, and roughage. 
And then here's a, a pasture sample, um, as, as you can see. Then subsequently collecting milk and, and meat samples. And, and then we start our analytical workflow, which uh, starts with the soil, uh, doing, doing soil testing, such as soil organic matter, total exchange capacity, various minerals within the soil. Um, study the plants as well, looking at, at, at fatty acid composition, also again looking at, at macro and uh, micronutrients, and then uh, similarly on, on, the, on the beef samples. So process the samples in the lab, uh, use mass spec based uh, technology. We identify the compounds, you get a large number of compounds, uh, a large number of peaks that need to be identified. And subsequently, we, we cluster these into chemical classes. So today I'll present data about phenolics, I'll present data about fatty acids as well. And then it's really tying these, these, these data together to see, do we see a, uh, a relationship? Uh, does improved soil health lead to improved plant quality or nutrient density? And does that lead to improved animal health and, and, and nutrient density? And uh, I've, I've come convinced to be convinced that uh, plant quality and nutrient density and animal health and nutrient density are, uh, are two P's in, this, in the same path. Uh, if you improve one, you improve the other because they're essentially uh, uh, the same thing. So what metabolomics does, or the study of a broad number of metabolites, uh, it goes beyond proteins and fats. Unfortunately, we have dumbed down foods a little bit to protein and, and, and fat. Uh, meat is protein, avocado is fat, uh, but that, that does not do justice to the complexity of food because that avocado probably contains 40,000 uh, compounds, wide variety of, uh, of, of phytochemical antioxidants, polyphenols, flavonoids. And the meat is not just protein. It is a bunch of vitamins and minerals, fatty acids. It is a bunch of mammalian metabolites derived from plants. It is answering, taurine, creatine, and a bunch of other bioactive peptides that can impact our, uh, our, our health. And <clears throat> it is really overlaying that food metabolome, so that complexity of the food. And I want to highlight is that we're absolutely scratching the surface. If you see the piece of meat here, I'd say we've, we've, we've mapped about this much of it. Uh, so we still got probably 90% of the piece of meat left the map, but um, it's more than uh, just uh, a small piece, which would be protein, vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids. Then we overlay this with human metabolome. As I showed you earlier, about 50% of the foods that we, or what we eat directly influence our metabolome. And then the nutrigenome is really how do these nutrients uh, re respond to our genes and that turn on or turn off disease risk. So uh, if it's going to be cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, how does it impact our pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin and can uh, help us ward of diabetes? Uh, these compounds, they interact with the cells of our, of our body and, uh, and, and trying to understand the, 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 the feedback on that. So... Without further ado, let's look at how livestock rearing and finishing uh, impacts the, the nutrient density of, of, of meat and milk. And uh, we'll, we'll present data on, uh, on, on, on beef, uh, but also in, in other species such as bison, uh, as well as uh, some goat and, and some cheese uh, as well that, uh, that we'll be looking at. But really the uh, big part is, uh, is uh, the Beef Nutrient Density Project, which was a, a multi-year project, probably the most complex project uh, I've ever undertaken in my professional career. Uh, it was, really, it was a, a big project, a lot of moving parts. Um, we've, we've, we've learned a lot, so I, I appreciate everyone's commitment and, and, and patience. Um, but it's a nutritional profile study of, of beef samples from commercial farms internationally and nationally, together with the Utah, uh, my current institution, Utah State, the Bionutrient Food Association, as well as uh, uh, Dacius, um, who has done some analysis and, and, and work on a, on a data platform. So in that study, we looked at soil samples, we collected soil samples, farmers were sending soil samples, forage samples, uh, stool samples of the cattle, as well as meat samples, three revised per farm, and uh, trying to uh, understand the relationship. So this was both grass-fed and grain-fed farmers, but the majority of samples as you'll see here, we're, we're grass-fed. Um, we open it up to whomever wanted to, uh, to participate. Um, of course, the farms that are doing, uh, employing agroecological practices, adaptive grazing practices that have a, a strong sense like, hey, I think this is improving the, the nutritional quality of the meat, where of course, 
the ones who were, were, were very eager to, to send samples as well. We do have various grain fed samples as well, which uh, is a combination of, uh, of samples that we collected that were sent in or that were bought off, off the shelf from major uh, grocery store or retailers where we would do the same thing, walk into a grocery store and buy, uh, and buy three steaks from, uh, from major retailers. So if we look at the location of the farm, um, fairly well represented it within the, within the US and, and Southern Canada, the, where the vast majority of, of samples came from, um, as you can see here. Um, we had some samples from Hawaii as well. Um, we got samples out of Australia and, and Uruguay, but these were provided through, through more of a, a wholesaler. Um, but um, the nature of the grass-fed beef market currently in, in the U.S. is that unless you buy direct to consumer, uh, a lot of the grass-fed beef that is available within the grocery store is typically sourced either from Australia, New Zealand, or, or, or Uruguay. Um, so amongst popular popular retailers, and then we also had some samples that uh, that that came uh, out of uh, out of the UK, and also has some some grain fed samples in there uh, as well. So if we look at start with uh, with the fatty acid data, and then we'll jump into the into the polyphenol data. Um, it's a little sch schematic draft of of the animal. So we have we have uh, cattle here, um, finished on a total mixed ration or finished on forages. What we typically see is, is that forages, they contain more of uh, what is called uh, 18, uh, uh, 3 and 3, which is an omega-3 fatty acid. It will be elongated uh, and you get an enrichment of omega-3s, whereas uh, corn or grains are higher in omega-6s and you get typically an enrichment in, in omega-6s based on, on, on historic data. And we were particularly interested in studying the variation across samples and uh, to, to find out like, okay, what is, uh, what is the cause of, uh, of this variation? And what is the typical landscape? Because a lot of the previous studies have been done more in sort of think of it like academic trials. So in a university feedlot versus maybe uh, out on pasture, um, there has been some work done in commercial profiling, but not to, to the uh, large extent uh, that, uh, that, that we try to or did within the, within the beef nutrient density project. Um, but as we look at the omega-6 to 3 ratio here, just jumping right into it, is that the omega-6 to 3 ratio is really considered a strong biomarker of, of beef quality. It is the amount of omega-6s divided by the omega-3s. So if you have more omega-3s and less omega-6s, then this ratio is starting to come uh, down. And a lower ratio is typically considered beneficial because it means you have less omega-6, and you have more omega-3s. Um, as you can see here on the grass-fed side of things is that there's a large concentration here around uh, the average landed at 1.7, so around one and a half to two. Um, and this was pretty much all the samples that landed here were from farmers that, that sent in samples, sort of the, your typical North American grass-fed be family farm. Uh, they were all uh, amongst sort of these, these, these superstar uh, rankings here that, uh, that really indicate high quality grass fed beef, which would be considered around uh, two or so. Um, then we have grain fed and, and grain fed isn't grain fed either. We see here that some grain fed samples are actually looking better than some grass fed beef samples. Uh, typically these were from feedlots that were um, sourced from, from family farm feedlots. So typically this would be less grain, shorter finishing phases. It would maybe be a dry lot that, that people employ, a lot of still direct to consumer sales, but maybe some consumers indicate, okay, I want some, uh, so it's, it's, uh, the marbling. So we do a short uh, grain finishing phase. Uh, so this is what we, what we see here with these samples, whereas these higher ones are off the shelf uh, samples typically bought at a, at, at a grocery store. Um, here also sourced from farmers practicing regenerative or rotational grazing practices. And then this question is here, are these uh, truly grass fed? Uh, they display more of a profile of, of feedlot uh, beef or at least grain finished beef. Um, so the question is, are these, uh, are these truly grass fed? And uh, I think one of the um, importance here is, is that an omega-6 to 3 ratio could potentially in the future be used to authenticate uh, uh, quality of, of, of grass-fed beef because as you can see here 90 percent of the samples that are grass-fed fall within this uh, this what we considered 
beneficial range of about one and a half to, uh, to, to two and a half, which, which really indicates uh, uh, high quality uh, uh, feeding. Now, I want to highlight it's feeding some byproduct or, or things such as that. It's, it's, I don't think it's very much a bad idea. We'll see it later on in, in some, uh, some bison data. So I do think there's some, some uh, potential for that. Maybe a controversial statement, but I do think there's some potential for that as well to feed to, to true byproducts. But uh, um, so we can upcycle uh, some additional nutrients, additional food, but we still, we'll, we'll see later on, you maintain a still very favorable omega-3 profile. So, and uh, um, I think that is key. So alpha linoleic acid is typically considered a quote unquote plant omega-3, but it's also the dominant omega-3 within our bodies and in the bodies of, uh, of, of cattle. Um, but it is really the omega-3 alpha linoleic acid. This is what is in plants. It gets uh, taken up within our, our, our bodies. Um, and this really forms the precursor to longer chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids such as DHA, EPA, and, and DPA, which are typically called uh, sort of the, the, the fish omega-3 fatty acids, but they're also found in, uh, in, in beef. Um, as you can see here, large variation, but on average, uh, they're, they're higher. And um, we'll see later on what is the reason for this variation. But uh, in, in the simplest form, forages are rich in the omega-3 ALA, grains are richer in the omega-6 uh, linoleic acid, uh, which is what you can see here. It's a little bit higher here in, in, in grain. Uh, again here, fairly bottom heavy, so low in the omega-6 linoleic acid. And then this is all in interesting also, is this, is this truly grass fat? Um, high amounts of linoleic acid I mean, this could potentially be used for uh, for for authentication, but it, it does make you question the, the quality of the forages or whether uh, grains were were indeed uh, fed, but perhaps not uh, disclosed. Um, I do want to highlight this is that these were uh, from uh, uh, more wholesalers that uh, that that provided uh, uh, these, and and from what I understand, had a suspicion. On, uh, on on whether it was truly grass fed and was one of the reasons why they sent it in, uh, and it turns out their their suspicion was uh, was correct. Um, DPA and EPA, so two major omega three fatty acids in grass fed beef. Um, as you can see here, EPA higher and a DPA higher, both are important for cardiovascular health, reducing inflammation and uh, improving brain function. Um, now, meat can be considered a, a, a decent source of that, not because it's super high, it's high enough where it can provide a meaningful uh, increase within our blood, as we'll see later on. Um, but there's often the comparison always comes up, so I'll, I'll address it head on. How does this compare to salmon? Well, it is lower than salmon, but um, we the nature of Western diets is that we consume more meat than we consume uh, salmon. So, by nature, by due to our consumption patterns, and given that meat is a popular uh, source of protein within the diet, having meat that is enriched with omega-3 fatty acids can actually contribute to uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acid intake uh, within, uh, within the diet because most of us consume beef more often than we consume uh, uh, fatty fish. Uh, so I think that's a key, key nuance because uh, you, you oftentimes hear that's like, well, does it really matter so little? Well, yeah. I, in my opinion, it does matter. And, it, and we'll see later on data suggests that it can contribute meaningfully to the amounts of omega-3s that you and I would have within our bodies if we regularly consume grass-fed beef. Um, this is about the simplest way where we can put it. Cows are what they eat. Um, if you look at the, the omega balance, which is a more recent concept, but it's basically the uh, or the, the proportion of omega-3s, the total polyunsaturated fatty acids, so forages are rich in omega in, in polyunsaturated fatty acids. If we have more omega threes, um, we have more um, a higher balance. So in this case, eighty percent of total polyunsaturated fatty acids within the plant. So this is the forage. Uh, so these were the pasture samples. Eighty percent of that is omega threes. In the uh, TMR, the total mixed ration, only about fifteen percent of this. And you can draw almost a straight line to the grain fed beef where this is uh, reflected. So more uh, omega-3s in your forage, more omega-3s in your meat. Less omega-3s in your feed, in this case, less omega-3s in your meat. It is, it is really is, is, is that simple uh, that uh, uh, 
coming back to the to the point counts are with E, then we see there's not a one to one, right? It's not like we have then 80% omega threes of all polypolyl unsaturated fatty acids in meat, but you can see here that uh, we do see a, a significant uh, accumulation as a result. Um, so this paper is currently in in uh, uh, in preparation, and we hope to submit that uh, later this year for publication uh, to be kind of. And, and this, I think, will be part of the graphical abstract because I think this puts it very clearly is, is that TMR, you have more omega-6. Forage, you have more omega-3s. If you then go to meat, more omega-3s in uh, the grass-fed meat and less omega-3s in the grain-fed meat and more omega-6s. How do I get a good omega-6 to 3 ratio? Well, we looked we uh, looked at a large number of correlations, and really the the only thing that really stood out was plant diversity. As you can see here, it kind of tapers off diminishing returns after about eight plants on pasture. So we asked all the farms through uh, through detailed uh, questionnaires that were developed by the by the Bionutrient Institute, how many plants on pasture do you have, and can you give us an, an indication of, of of the composition? And what we found here was is that uh, roughly we can see it. Here, about eight or so is when the regression line starts to taper off. Um, but we see here lower omega-6 to 3 ratio with uh, a higher amounts of plants on pasture with about tapering off, diminishing returns of about eight plants. And what this really tells us is that um, grazing monocultures is limiting the omega-6 omega to 3 profile a little bit. That's what we're seeing. So, and, and we also know if we sort of like zoom out the polyculture, there's plenty of research to suggest that it's better for, for plant and, and soil health uh, as well uh, to have a polyculture as opposed to uh, more of a monoculture. And this is from some work uh, in uh, uh, bison. And uh, bison, while a, a very special animal and a North American symbol, uh, it is also uh, a mammal. And um, if you put bison on uh, TMR, you get a uh, omega-6 to 3 profile that reflects uh, a cow on TMR, essentially. About 8, which is typically what you see in, in feedlot. Here we see on pasture about 2.8. Uh, and here's really where it becomes interesting. In this, this study, we give uh, the animals also free choice access to corn here. And about 30% or so came from, uh, came from corn. And, and in the future, I'd like to uh, give them some different byproducts as well, because then you know, the corn isn't specifically grown for, uh, for, for, for feed. But in this case, we, we gave them corn on pasture. And we see that the omega-6 to 3 ratio is still what I would consider to be very favorable at 3.7. And I'll, I'll be 100% honest with you. If we ran a human trial, I doubt whether we would see a difference between these groups as a result. Maybe between these groups, but feeding up to 30% corn on pasture uh, actually still maintains what I would consider a, a fairly favorable ratio. Then even, and this comes back to the data that we saw, the pen finishing, finishing on a feedlot, but with uh, free choice hay and corn, where the animal eats, uh, in this case, about 60% of their diet from, uh, from, from alfalfa and meadow hay, as opposed to uh, a, a pure TMR that was about 70, 80% corn, you can see that you still maintain a very favorable omega 6 3 profile. So kind of what we observed within the uh, base nutrient density project, where we saw, okay, some of these grain fat samples still have what are considered fairly favorable omega 6 3 profile, is just due to uh, feeding less, less corn, essentially. Um, and here we can we can see that, and in this work we also look at stocking density. It didn't have any impact uh, on it, um, uh, but this was a controlled study that we did in bison that we completed uh, very recently. Now, if we look at other species, we'll, we'll split in some monogastric such as pigs and and, and chickens, uh, as well as our, our current diet, the current standard Western diet. This is considered by by various people to be a reason. Uh, so there's nothing per se wrong with omega-6s. This is, uh, uh, some of them are essential. We should get them within our diet, but it's really these high amounts of omega-6s that we're consuming and low amounts of omega-3s that is considered to be in part problematic um, in, uh, in, in, in the Western, Western diet, uh, which historical levels have put it about 4.1 and our current intake in the standard American diet or standard Western diet, I should say, is about 20 to 1. Um, so 
And this is mainly because we're not consuming enough omega-3s, really. That is, uh, that is the issue. It's overconsumption of omega-6s, but also not consuming uh, enough omega-3s, uh, certainly. And, and here, for instance, as you can see here, grass-fed beef, uh, 2.1. We have here grain-fed beef, 7.2. Um, so even grain-fed beef, if you eat grain-fed beef, uh, you'd still could bring your omega-6 to 3 ratio down. Um, bison, uh, same thing here, and this is uh, grass grain fed bison plus, plus, free, plus free choice access. So we can see here that there's a, a benefit here corn soy free pork plus daily pasture access. You get it to about five or so, is what we noticed. If you feed 50% corn and soy plus daily pasture for the pigs, uh, then uh, it's about 10. Um, and then Grain fed pork, no pasture. So, already you know, sort of KFO pork in this case, we'd see uh, that it's about 30. Um, chicken, same thing. Uh, corn, soy fat chicken, no pasture, about uh, 18. That makes this three ratio 10 for um, corn, soy fat chicken, and daily pasture. In this case, you know, obviously, a chicken would still consume quite a bit of feed, even when, uh, when on, on, on pasture. Um, and in this case, when it's a corn, soy ration, you, you get about an omega-6 ratio of 10. And this is some work from, a, from an Amish farmer that, uh, that, that, that we studied. Uh, and what they actually did was they got it down to one, which was quite surprising to me because I then went in the literature and looked at uh, uh, sort of data on, uh, um, on wild uh, birds. And even those don't, oh. usually don't reach one, they reach about two or, or, or three. If you look at uh, things such as pheasants or other, uh, or quail. Um, in this case, these animals were fed flax and, and kelp as well as uh, fish meal, but especially also if you feed a good amount of flax, which is very rich in, in the omega-3 ALA, you can really really bring this uh, this ratio down uh, by, by switching out uh, uh, corn and soy with, uh, with flax and, uh, and, and kelp. Uh, also, the main grain ingredients there were, were barley uh, and, and, and peas and, and wheat. So that, uh, that, that, uh, that also helped. And they, some of these were also uh, sprouted, which you also know improves the omega-6 to 3 ratio. So it improves the omega-3 profile within, uh, within the grain. So um, obviously the farmer made a deliberate effort to bring it down, but it was quite amazing to see that you can uh, get uh, uh, chicken in a one-to-one -one ratio. So can it be a good source? Um, well, there's no U.S. guidelines, but official European food guidelines, you can label everything, uh, anything over 40 milligrams per 100 gram omega-3 fatty acids as sources of long chain omega-3s. So this is milligram per 100 gram beef, assuming a ribeye fat content average 15 grams. We see that that various of these uh, will reach that, uh, that, 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 that threshold. Uh, uh, and obviously, um, fattier cuts have, have more of a chance to, 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 to reach that as well, which kind of brings sort of, you know, brings to light this idea that maybe we shouldn't fear uh, uh, fattier cuts uh, as, as much as uh, uh, we are sometimes uh, um, being suggested because you can also provide omega-3s here. And, uh, and if we assume that uh, um, we get over 40 here, I mean, like I said, there's no US labeling for it, but um, this could be something that uh, could potentially be, uh, eventually become on, on, on a package for labeling. Um, then the next question you may have, well, Stefan, that's fine and all, on paper it looks good, but can this actually increase our blood? And there's work uh, done in, in the past that's with suggestions. Uh, Grass-fed group, grain-fed group, you see here that DHA, the cosohexanoic acid, which is really a very long chain omega-3 fatty acids, very important for brain health, important for growth, important for cardiovascular health. We can see that we can bring this up about a percent or so. Um, and also, if you look at total omega-3 content in plasma phospholipids in, uh, in, in prior work, again, we can see here a bump of about 2%. Um, after about uh, uh, five weeks of, 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 of consumption. So obviously this, uh, this indicates that uh, at least in the short term, you can increase your omega-3s and there's no studies that really go beyond a, uh, a few months. So, but perhaps over a lifetime, this could matter. I mean, um, we, we, we don't know, but uh, uh, at least it would seem that in this, you can increase your omega-3 profiles and over a lifetime that should be fairly beneficial. So what's the relationship with soil health then? Um, if we look at here, nutrient cycling, um, can this improve soil health and we'll put nutrients back in through uh, 
their feces as well as as well as urine cycle it up and it becomes hopefully a uh, uh, sustainable cycle um, monoculture cornfields typically uh, require heavy external external inputs so um, here we're really interested in seeing like what is this relationship with soil health well we looked at this and and I uh, won't go through through all the details, but this is uh, also from our, from our paper that's in preparation. We looked at uh, what is the relationship, and what we basically found was we found a uh, the meat omega six to three had a negative relationship, which in this case is good because it means lower meat, meat omega six to three uh, with a uh, larger number of plant numbers. So plants on pasture, more plants on pasture, as I showed you earlier, lower meat uh, omega six to three ratio. So which we consider beneficial. Uh, percent grazing and finishing phase, so this cannot be a surprise, but it, sometimes you gotta kick in open doors, is, is that more animals graze, uh, as opposed to uh, being fat feed, the better the omega-6 to 3 profile is. And, but we did not see any relationship with, with things such as uh, uh, soil organic matter, um, or per se paddock resting period. We didn't see that either, and we actually do have some folks that do continuous grazing, but if your stocking density is, is low enough, then that, 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 that might work actually. So, uh, uh, but obviously if you have greater stocking density doing rotational grazing, more plant rest might be a, uh, a good thing. However, if we look at this on a group level, we do see that if you manage it as a pasture or, or an adjacent cornfield, soil organic matter in the same ecoregion is higher in the pasture, total exchange capacity, the ability to, to uh, exchange nutrients from the plant to the soil, higher, zinc, higher, trend for iron to be higher, trend for phosphorus to be higher, potassium to be higher. Um, so I would consider these to be indicative of, of, of a healthier pasture. And really this comes back to, uh, um, work that we, we published, uh, and this is by Alan Franz Lubers, the, the gentleman who was earlier collecting soil samples, this is from work that we did in, in, in the studies in the United States. And basically what we concluded from this is that uh, rotationally grazed perennial grasslands can store more soil organic carbon and nitrogen, improve soil surface stability, compared to neighboring croplands that, that produce commodity feed grains for, for feedlot finishing. So. Let's say you have a farm here, a mile away, you're, you're growing feed uh, that goes into the commodity market, managing that land as pasture and selling it as grass-fed beef seems to be having uh, beneficial effects for, uh, for, for soil health. Um, again, maybe not too surprising to many of you, but one-to-one um, -one comparisons um, have been uh, uh, absent within the, within the literature historically. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we try to contribute to that and other folks such as, uh, as Peter Big and, and various other groups, uh, especially in Colorado uh, State University, are also contributing to, uh, to, to similar work to uh, look at uh, how different field, uh, pastures are managed and how this impacts soil health to make that, make, really make that connection between soil health and um, uh, subsequent nutrient density. So in this case, I want to go into phytochemicals. Now, what the hell are phytochemicals? Well, they're uh, phyto plant, uh, plant chemicals. Um, plants contain polyphenols, they contain flavonoids, they contain benzoic acids, they probably contain hundreds of thousands of compounds, and these are eaten by the animal and uh, upcycled within their tissue um, into the meat. And then the question is, well, what does that uh, do to us? But we know that these compounds are um, polyphenol, flavonoids, these are anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antioxidants, so uh, they could have potent animal health benefits, um, but could they also have, uh, have, have, have human health benefits? And what this thing is really unique of an animal is, is that um, one question you may ask, well, why don't we consume plants? Well, I believe you should consume plants and consuming things such as blueberries and carrots are excellent sources of polyphenols and carotenoids. But what is really unique about animals is that they consume vegetation and plants you and I cannot consume, allowing for a further avenue to increase the phytochemical richness. And one thing we've, we found out uh, due to the Beef Nutrient Density Project and other work really is, is that um, these plant polyphenols, they become um, transformed within the animal. So let's say if we look at a compound like quinic acid or benzoic acid or cinnamic acid, these are very dominant uh, plant metabolites. So they appear within, within the plant. And then the interesting part was for us to learn that these compounds actually get metabolized within the animal. 
they become hydroxylated on different positions. They become bound to sugar. They become bound to amino acids. They become bound to um, uh, other, uh, such as sulfates, salts. And, and, and really that wasn't per se clear from the literature in the past. Uh, so this was something that we really have to learn over, over time and then kind of recalibrate our methods and then look at other things. Uh, because in the literature in the past, they were reported using a different technique and saying like, okay, benzoate, we measure benzoate, and then you measure benzoate in the, in the meat. And uh, high performance liquid chromatography suggests that this is here. Then in newer techniques, we have a mass detector attached to that. And the mass detector tells us, well, this is really not here. It's really this, 2,6-dihydroxybenzoic acid. Very similar compound, but different mass. So if you have a mass detector on it, you quickly find out, oh, well, it's not actually the plant compound. It's this other compound that's in here. And then we actually learned a lot by looking at, believe it or not, human breast milk data. Um, because humans are not a mammal. We get these compounds uh, uh, pre-processed. So this is another interesting question that opens up probably five, 10 years more of research. Um, what if we could have these, these compounds that are already in quote unquote mammalian forms? What if we get those in our body and we already have them pre-processed? I mean, we know that if we get heme iron uh, within our bodies, that this is beneficial. Um, is it the case for some of those phenolics as well? At the moment, I don't know. Um, but okay, let's look at the hyporic acid, which really emerged. We've seen this consistently in, in, in various data sets. Hyporic acid seems to be a good biomarker. Um, it's an antioxidant. It is produced from phenolics within uh, the gut microbiota as well as the liver. So let's say we give you a bunch of polyphenols or we give a cow a bunch of forages. It starts to take these, these phenol groups and turns this into an antioxidant in a mammalian form, hyporic acid being one of them. And actually what's interesting in humans, having higher levels of hyporic acid is uh, associated with reduced odds of metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is really a collection of uh, various uh, ailments such as blood pressure, high glucose, uh, uh, elevated triglycerides, et, et cetera. So if we, uh, can reduce our odds of metabolic syndrome, that is, uh, that is a good thing. And then we can see here that there is uh, um, uh, higher levels. And then and as we see here, there's uh, yeah, a variety of samples. That, well, again, quite a large variation, which is also uh, uh, very interesting uh, to, uh, uh, to, to observe. But in general, grass fed beef is, is, is higher. Uh, Picresol sulfate, again, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, a mammalian metabolite. It kind of echoes this. Um, now you can see here that a lot of samples are in here, but here the median here is still about uh, twice as high as the median uh, in, in, in the grain fed samples with various, again, some samples that are really rise uh, uh, to the top. Um, but again, here provided through, um, which is a downstream metabolite of, of hyporate, because of sulfate. So these are antioxidants, maybe things you've never heard about, but these are important uh, antioxidants uh, within uh, our bodies. Catechol sulfate, uh, same thing. It uh, acts as an antioxidant. It can prevent lipid peroxidation, which is the formation of harmful compounds from lipid oxidation, which again, kind of, here's where really where the omegas, which are prone to oxidation, well, if you have more of the antioxidants in your meat at the same time, maybe you prevent some of that lipid oxidation as well and could potentially explain why uh, the, despite the modest amounts of omega-3s in beef, you actually see a meaningful rise in the blood. And this is probably because there's cofactors such as calical sulfate that kind of protect that omega-3 from, from oxidation. This is at least a, hypo a working hypothesis that we're, we're, uh, we will have to... Uh, uh, investigate in, in the future, but it could just be that, okay, you know, you have more forages, more omega-3s, but also because you're providing those antioxidants with it, those omega-3s are actually working together in synergy, and therefore we get uh, uh, these omega-3s uh, within our body at higher amounts than you would think by just looking at a, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, Cursetin trigalacticide, if you look at a slightly different pathway, cinnamic acid, as, as you may guess, um, sounds a lot like cinnamon. That is right, because cinnamon is about 30% uh, cinnamic acid. But cinnamic acid, you find it in any green plant. Um, it gets converted again here, uh, 
previous work suggests it was quercetin. Turns out, like, if you look at the data, actually more of it will become quercetin 3 galactoside because it's it's bound to uh, here a, a, a sugar. Um, and again, here, grass fat, you can see that there's a, an increase. And how can we be so confident that there's a transfer from forest to animal? Well, in, in uh, other metabolomics data, we looked at this compound benzoate, which is uh, dominant uh, in, in forage. We can see that here. And low in corn-based uh, TMR, then benzoate is transformed through the gut microbiota and the liver of the animal into hyporate. And we can see that this, this, this mirrors each other. So more benzoate in the forage equals more of its downstream metabolite hyporate in, in, in the meat. Uh, again, coming back to the um, similar findings in humans, uh, you, you are what you eat, uh, at least uh, to an extent. Now, I do want to highlight this is that this is the golden rule in science. If you 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 think of it or find it, there's a good chance someone else has showed this uh, way before you did. Uh, 1987, the 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 year I was born, uh, people already knew phytochemicals decreased with finishing days on TMR. This is what Dwight Larrick at out of NC State in the, in the 80s. And what they did was they periodically slaughtered uh, animals here. They slaughtered them before they went on TMR. Uh, at uh, 40, 60 days on TMR, around 90 days, 120, and they see that already within 60 days, you, you cut the phytochemicals by two and a half times already, and which is really interesting because this two and a half number, this two, two and a half number is something we can seem to be finding too. Grass-fed beef, about two to two and a half times higher in phytochemicals than, than, than grain-fed beef. And uh, uh, so it is really, Intuitively, as you think about it, it is when the animal goes into the feedlot and you expose it to less of these compounds, as we see here. That's really when uh, things start to uh, start to start to go down. And uh, so you could even argue then, and then I've met various farmers that do so, that employ rotational grazing practices during the cow calf during the stalker phase. So if you start here in a feedlot, right, your drop is lower as well. Or in the feedlot, you feed more phytochemically rich byproducts. Maybe the drop is not as high. So. Um, there are certainly areas within various fields of, of, of uh, uh, with, even within in feedlot systems where there's room for, for, for improvement, I think, that uh, to, to improve the phytochemical richness uh, of, of, of the meat. And as we'll see later on, these are also potent flavor products. So um, bison, um, another mammal, um, do that to a bison, you get similar, uh, similar results. Bison on grass more hypore than, than bison on grain, and as well as peak resol sulfate, cinnamoroglycine, cinnamic acid, mixed with the amino, uh, amino acid glycine. You can see that here also higher. This was also a very interesting finding. Stachydrine is actually a major phenolic in alfalfa. What were these grain-fed animals eating? They were eating about 30, 40% alfalfa. So alfalfa brings us up a little bit. So there's well, some some good findings uh, that we that we made there too. But again, uh, nutrient transfer, uh, plant to animal. Animals are what they eat. Um, vitamin metabolites here in the bison. Um, here is a, a full difference. It's from from more untargeted metabolomics data. So this one point four two basically means how much is more is in the grass than in the grain. NMN, uh, it's a compound that's studied as a quote unquote anti aging compound. If you give it to a mice, you can let it live longer. Um, I'm not sure if it works in humans, uh, but um, while I see this, is, is that despite the grass finished animal being older, uh, it, it has a younger, more athletic phenotype. And we'll see this later on too. Here, alpha tocopherol and, 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 and carotene, beta carotene, more in forage, more in the animal. But here's the, the kicker, vitamin B5, vitamin B6, gamma tocopherol type of vitamin E was actually higher in the grain fed uh, uh, bison. Why? Because these are higher in the, in, in, in the grains. So coming back to the fact that maybe feeding some byproduct or having your animals maybe graze a neighboring farm uh, that has the uh, crops harvested and it's put some nutrients back in, it eats all the corn stalks, might actually not be a, a bad thing because you get some uh, other compounds upcycled uh, there as well. Um, and this comes back to the fact that, um, again, presenting this data, but we already knew this for, for a while, 
uh, traditional wisdom, right? Like humans had figured this out long before uh, uh, the invention of the of the mass spec. Uh, I want to quote you from uh, from Life in the Rocky Mountains by Warren Angus Ferris, um, who took that information from 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 indigenous peoples uh, as well, the traditional wisdom. But anyway, he traveled the Great Plains from 1830 to 1835, and he uh, notes that. Uh, his crew fed on bison, as, as indigenous peoples had done for ages. He said, bison in poor flesh were on the worst diet imaginable. I'm, I'm picturing a uh, uh, not so great looking uh, pasture. Uh, but as the animal fed on diverse mixtures of plants, uh, a very biodiverse pasture, he said, no other meat could compare. With it, we require no seasoning. We boil, roast, or fry as we please and live upon it solely. That's what seems most singular. We never tire of or disrelish it, which would be the case with almost any other meat. I am pretty sure that he's referring to the phytochemical richness of the meat. Because these phytochemicals, they are actually flavor compounds as well. These are things that you can taste. You can taste, you can smell terpenes, you can taste polyphenols, you can taste um, uh, flavonoids. These are things that you, you uh, uh, can pick up on. So essentially the taste test that he did would suggest, oh, this meat, which would be what he describes the worst diet imaginable. I don't want to say that, but it's it's basically sort of you know our probably our modern day equivalent of a monoculture, or or the grass was not really uh, in 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 season. Uh, but when they go on the plant diverse pasture, he could they could empirically um, uh, note that as well as indigenous peoples that hunted during certain periods of the year when the animals were fattest and and had access to the, to the to the best grasses. So flavor and health are are related and. Uh, um, the data would suggest that what uh, Warren Angus Ferris wrote down 200 years ago, uh, he was uh, certainly onto something at that time, and uh, um, so that's quite uh, quite quite amazing, actually. Um, animal health, nutrient density, animal health. I mean, I looked at this from the press perspective of nutrients, right? But we have to be realistic. The animal eats these forages first and foremost to nourish itself. Uh, if it has more exposure to phytochemicals, if it has more vitamins, animal health improves, but a healthier animal is also arguably a more nutritious animal. But if we look at animal health, uh, we see less oxidative stress in the pastured animals, uh, the conversion of uric acid to, to alantoic acid. Uh, so more uh, uric acid here, less alantoic acid suggests that there's less oxidative stress in, in, in the pastured animals. And then another compound that we had looked at uh, in, in, in previous work as well is 4-HNE. 4-HNE uh, is a potentially harmful product of lipid peroxidation. Again here, remember I talked about chemical sulfate that can prevent this. Um, well, the I IARC, the International Agency of Research on Cancer actually uh, suggested that uh, uh, in one of the reports, I mean, I think everyone has known about or heard about the fact that meat is a potential uh, type 2 car carcinogen. Um, if you go to probably page uh, 100 and something of the report, you see that actually the association is with uh, uh, processed meat and not so much fresh meat. So this would be, you know, sausages. I'm also not talking about artisanal sausages, most likely, right? Like I would also say that uh, maybe uh, the sausage cured with salt and thyme is not the same as perhaps putting a bunch of uh, uh, additives in, in it. And, and there's some work in, in pork from, from Europe that would uh, suggest that traditional cured ham healthier than a industrial cured, cured ham. Uh, but my point being is here is that for HNE, is a product of lipid peroxidation. In humans, it's implicated with cancer, cardiovascular, uh, uh, health, neurodegenerative diseases. And what is really interesting here is that, uh, if, you know, this is something that wasn't per se on my radar, but actually getting these compounds in, eating these compounds is considered uh, perhaps not uh, uh, ideal for us. There's some, some, some concern there. Well, it turns out that a healthier animal actually has less of that compound to begin with because the animal has less oxidative stress, less lipid peroxidation. So here it really becomes like animal health and then nutrition really becomes to become intertwined, right? Really where uh, um, a healthier animal gives you maybe more of what you do want and, and less of what you don't want and, and a healthier animal may produce less of these, uh, these, these products. And then here, this is really what this shows is malate, succinylcarnitine. These are 
the TCA cycle, the mitochondria, which is really the life of our cells, uh, they have um, more of these mitochondrial intermediates. And the way I look at this is, is that, you know, my, my background is in, in human exercise physiology, and we were doing work on, on athletes as well as, you know, maybe sedentary individuals. I see a lot of parallels there between animals out on pasture that walk maybe uh, seven kilometers a day, which is about four or five miles, right, a, a day, and the animals in the feedlot do not walk as fast. So you get more of an athletic phenotype. On top of that, when you feed forages that are high in these polyunsaturated fatty acids, you're also driving more of this mitochondrial metabolism. Um, so the way I, I, I view this is that the metabolites of pastured animals, they show a more athletic phenotype. Whether that translates to healthier meat for us, I don't know. But it is really interesting that if, if you just look at it, the animals out on pasture, they look like, look surprisingly similar to a, to a, a human that, that cycles or runs or, or walks a lot. So um, this is from work in the, in, in the bison linking animal health and nutrient density. Um, basically what we found was is that the pen finished animals, their glucose metabolic health went down, their um, protein breakdown went up, their oxidative stress went up, their advanced glycation products went up. The pasture finished animals, as I mentioned, the mitochondrial health went up, their NMN went up, which would suggest they're quote unquote younger, um, even though they were <laughs> age older, uh, but they have a younger phenotype. Um, think of it again as, as humans, right? Uh, some humans age different than others. Maybe part of it is that if you exercise, you may age a little bit better. Um, or physically active, I should say. There's more ways to be uh, active. You can uh, garden, farm, uh, but at least have, have some sort of physical activity. Uh, Pam finished here. Some nutrients were actually going up. So it's not uh, per se, you know, that this is always a negative, especially here because the pen finishing, they only ate about uh, 40, 50% corn. The rest was free choice access to hay. Uh, but the fascia finish, we do see this, this benefit improving uh, in a healthier animal and more, more nutrients than meat. This is from the bison work that we published uh, last year and then uh, work from the Beef Nutrient Density Project will also uh, at least suggest uh, something something similar, but it's, it's, it's not published yet, although I presented some data from that. Okay, final part. Connection to human health, last, last five minutes. Um, health effects of passion meat consumption. Well, one of the things we usually study in randomized controlled trials is inflammation. No one in your randomized controlled trial, when you feed people grass-fed and grain-fed beef is gonna develop heart disease. And if they do, you probably have a problem. Um, but inflammation is a good underlying reason that if we are systemically inflamed for 20 years, increase our risk for cardiometabolic disease. Um, now, if you're a consumer, and we all are, you're likely very confused about the red meat uh, headlines in, in, in the news. One week, uh, red meat um, is deadly. Then researchers came out and said, well, based on epidemiological data, uh, maybe it's not the best advice. Then people come out and say, well, it's really not okay. Uh, despite news on the contrary. Important to notice that these are epidemiological associations. So you fill out a food questionnaire, fill them out regularly every couple of years, follow you for 20 years and see uh, the level of disease that people develop. Um, unfortunately, no studies have ever asked someone, is your meat coming from pastures versus non-pastures? Now, my guess would be is that people eat grass-fed meat probably do a uh, hundred other things beneficial for their health, but it would be, I think, a good next step to do a study like that to see do these associations hold when you're consuming pastured meat? Maybe uh, they do, but or maybe they don't. Well, my guess would be is that people also eat more fruits and vegetables. They drink less, they smoke less, they gamble less, they uh, uh, are... Uh, maybe higher socioeconomic status, all things that, uh, that, that you can't really put your finger on, but that, that matter. So eating became at some point very complicated, but maybe it's a good idea to eat both. And maybe it's a good idea to eat red meat as part of a healthy dietary pattern, which is a conclusion from a paper that we had uh, published a few years ago. Uh, if you look at the data, if you consume it as a part of a Mediterranean diet or a bold diet or a traditional American diet, typically neutral or protective red meat, is it the red meat? I don't know. But if you consume it as a whole food diet, the increased risk seems to be happening when you start consuming it as a standard Western diet. 
Um, but if we look at passive meat consumption, there's not a whole lot of research uh, uh, out on this at, at, at the moment. Uh, we just uh, completed a randomized controlled trial and, and uh, uh, if, uh, I'll, I'll know the fatty acid data in about a month from now. Uh, but um, if we look at the, 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 the previous data in um, IL-6, uh, inflammation, when you consume, in this case, this work out of, uh, out of Australia, consume kangaroo one to two hours after the meal, you have less inflammation than when you consume green fed meat. But mind you, this was Wagyu beef that spent 300 days in a feedlot. So they probably took the exact or sort of it couldn't be more opposing. Right, a wild animal versus Wagyu beef that was uh, in a feedlot for 365 days or so. Um, we also replicated the study, and we'll also know results from that this uh, this fall. We re completed uh, participant 36 uh, this uh, this this spring uh, on that, where we feed people Impossible Burger, grass-fed beef, grain-fed beef. Uh, so that that randomized control trial is done, and this summer we're working on the analysis. So, so stay tuned on that. Love. We'll various randomized controlled trials coming out over the next uh, few years. In publication, I don't know if you noticed it on the first slide where I talked about that Israeli paper, they submitted their paper in January, 2019, and it got published in September, 2020. So um, it definitely takes a little bit of time uh, before these things to, to, uh, to, to get published. Uh, but hopefully some of this data will roll out in the year 2025. Um, C-reactive protein um, here again, another inflammatory marker less when you eat kangaroo. Other Italian scientists found that if you eat grass-fed pecorino that is grazing very biodiverse pastures in Sardinia, you see that interleukin-6, another inflammatory marker after 10 weeks of consuming, decreases. The placebo is just store-bought, non-specified uh, uh, cheese, um, but the grass-fed pecorino apparently had a beneficial effect. Um, one study done in, in, in America uh, that looked at this and they found no difference um, but the grain fed beef was, uh, on a ration that was enriched with oleic acid. So probably a little bit healthier than, than your regular grain fed beef, but it, it does, it is important to note that, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 there's only some differences uh, there or the difference might be might be subtle. And also the animals were more on, on a monoculture Bermuda pasture. So I'm not sure diversified versus monoculture pasture, time frame, background diet matters. We recently completed a, a study as well. There I have some pilot data from, but just to, to, to focalize it, this is that we put people on produce and uh, uh, meat, milk and eggs from regenerative agriculture versus conventional agriculture. And what we found was, is that just switching from a standard American diet and actually eating some whole foods, such as meat, milk, eggs, and fresh fruits and vegetables, irrespective of how it was produced, actually improves your health 80, you know, gets you 80% of the way there. And, and what we're initially finding in some of the data points is that there may be a small benefit for regenerative agriculture, but it's, it's, it's more subtle when you compare this standard American diet to a just a whole foods diet, irrespective of where, where it came from. So, so I think that's important not to say that regenerative agriculture cannot have benefits or that eating a diet like that for 30 years cannot have health benefits, but in a short-term randomized controlled trial, the effects of it are, are subtle if you look at the overall bigger picture. So I think that's very important to note as well is that if you eat grain-fed beef as part of a very healthy diet, I mean, the short enough it is, I don't believe the reason we have metabolic disease in the U.S. is because we're eating uh, grain-fed beef. Um, I think the, the, it's, it's a deeper problem than that. But here, another work from uh, an Argentinian group uh, finding that uh, more alpha tocopherol, more beta carotene precursors to vitamin uh, E and A uh, are non significantly increased. So, at least the transcripts. Final part uh, pork, um, tromboxane B2, another lipid mediator, an oxidation product. Um, you see that when people consume regular pork, uh, over a prolonged period of time, you see that this is uh, uh, actually, or it was measured over 12 hours, you see that this is higher. Um, and then the DHA was also, uh, uh, sorry, it's over not a 12 hour, a 12 week period. We see that the DHA content improves within the uh, blood of people. And then this lipid oxidation product is actually remains similar, whereas you feed them regular pork, you see that this is increasing. Final part is, is that chicken and eggs 
also again finding similar findings that uh, this is uh, this is improved. So to wrap it up, um, phytonutrients specifically become and concentrate in the meat and milk of animals finished on biodiverse pastures. You see this upcycling of, of forages and actually what's the thing we learned now and which made it a, a hell of a lot more complicated is, is that actually it gets transformed in the mammal to other forms, which we're currently trying to understand. But uh, it turns out that then it might be also be a benefit actually is that you get the plant compound, the animal transforms it, and then you eat it. Um, but in general, they have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, uh, and antimicrobial effects in livestock. Maybe some benefits to humans, but it really is, I cannot say either way at the moment because there's just not a lot of data on it. And, and while, and I would, you know, you need, really need more randomized controlled trials on it. Even the randomized controlled trials that we did, I'd like to see more and more, right? Really, it's like you do a meta-analysis of 15 trials and then it shows something that, okay, you, you start to feel confident. But I think the initial pilot data would suggest that there are some benefit to be gained with pastured animal source food consumption, um, specifically omega-3 enriched meat. Um, but I also would highlight that diet quality is such an important consideration. So um, eating pastured meat and milk, uh, if, if all of the fast food chains tomorrow switch to grass-fed beef, um, and we kept eating our, our fast food diet, I don't think we would get materially healthier. Um, so and I think that's also an important thing to, uh, to, to note. With that, um, I'd like to go into discussion, but first let me thank all of the folks that uh, made this possible. Um, also a big shout out to the Bionutrient Institute, Dan, Amanda, and, and Shauna who helped us uh, with, uh, with uh, this study, uh, gathering all the sample uh, samples from uh, uh, the farmers, uh, uh, recruitment of the farmers, uh, uh, recruiting funds as well, as well as various folks within Utah State, USDA ARS that we've been working uh, with for, for a while, uh, specifically the Northern Grains Research, Northern Great Plains Research Lab, uh, and a collaboration with South Dakota, which was really the, the bison work, and then uh, all, the, all the funders, uh, that, uh, which was a combination of, of uh, USDA federal funds as well as uh, philanthropical funds and, 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 and industry funds that uh, all kind of came together and uh, allowed us to, uh, to do this work. And with that, I'd like to take any questions uh, that, that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. That was uh, quite a whirlwind. <laughs> um, so, much, so much information you packed there into that hour. Um, I, I must say, as someone who's been doing this research with project with you and, you know, more broadly for the past three or four years and having been basically trained in some biochemistry and things like that, I, at this point, I think I understand everything you said and I'm really excited by it, but I'm wondering how much, <laughs> how much everyone else got, because there was a lot of, a lot of big words and, and um, it was fast and a lot of graphs, which people aren't necessarily um, intuitively able to, to interpret. So I just, I've got a, I've got a couple, you know, key points I want to emphasize. Sure. Um, but I see Shauna turned her camera on, which doesn't usually, which I think means she has something she'd like to, like to, like to ask. When, when, when she goes, Shauna. <laughs> Usually I, ch I try to stay in the dark here, but I was just curious, Stefan, your thoughts on lab grown meat and meat alternatives. If you've done any work with that or have any in the future and if not what are just your gut reactions uh yeah no it's a good point i mean uh, the short of it is, is no because we don't have uh, it's not commercially available at the moment and uh but you know we, we see the importance of what the animal grazes right uh it's the upcycling of phytochemicals and, and fatty acids into the the meat and now maybe if you put some omega-3s in the growth media you can maybe do that but you know to be honest with you I don't really understand the transfer of all the phytochemicals from the forage into the meat. I don't think anyone really does. So trying to emulate that in a lab, because the think about the saying you are what you eat. Well, lab grown meat is what it eats. Whatever you throw into the growth media is what the meat to an extent is going to become. I don't see how you can replicate 40, 50,000 metabolites without uh, grazing. 
is the shortening of it. So it's going to be, you can grow on meat, but it will be probably more simplified in its composition. That will be my initial uh, uh, hypothesis or gut feeling. And you um, did, as you said, I think, as part of the USDA human trials, feed people grass-fed meat, beef versus, um, well, for a week, and then afterwards they'd eat some uh, corn-fed, and then, then afterwards they'd eat some Impossible Burger. Yeah. Um, I You didn't share with us any of those data you've collected yet. Uh, you, can you, is there anything you can say from what you've, what you've um, <clears throat> seen but haven't published until you are being a good scientist and not showing us graphs? No, I mean, I'd, if I had some, some concrete data, I, I would show it to you. We're uh, probably like uh, three weeks away from having all the inflammatory markers done. So, okay. so I'm, I, I, yeah, I don't know at this, uh, at this point. We, we try to replicate the kangaroo study and uh, uh, we successfully completed the feeding trials. So that was a huge thing because those are things are, are, they take a long time as well and they're complicated. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know at this point that, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, very, very excited to see that as a, you know, addendum or a, you know, supplement to this project we've been working on together. Yeah, so, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, I'm we'll definitely uh, uh, publish this uh, next year. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'll just say to people, um, maybe that now that <clears throat> Stefan's not running at a mile a minute, you can, uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A, and we'll we'll get to them about in about twenty minutes. So feel free. I don't see four in there right now. So definitely, if you if you put one in now, you probably will get it answered. Erwin, did you have something you wanted to bring up? Yes, I'm. I'm wondering, Stefan. Uh, thanks for your very uh, good presentation. Very. Uh... Very rich, and I heard it before parts of it, so made me understand better to hear it twice. <laughs> Probably a third time would even be better. Um, amazing <laughs> what, what outcomes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's you amazing what outcomes you already already yeah. found. It's it's great. Um, I'm wondering, as a consumer, when I prepare my beef, when I cook it or bake it, what does that mean for the omega trees? Because um, they're they're highly oxidative, like they they oxidate easily. Um, with with warmth, you put in oxidation, I guess. So, what's what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, we we haven't really found that uh, cooking it really negatively alters it. Uh, um with it using normal cooking procedures even if you grill it or, or cook it in an oven or uh in terms of the the omega-3s they stay uh fairly similar um one thing that does happen maybe with prolonged cooking is that you form some of those compounds like 4 h &E or other uh compounds but here's also sort of the kicker is is that some some work that was done out of uh, out of Belgium where they they simulated sort of a gut absorption model. If you add spices to it, which is common uh, in most people, pepper or maybe some other spices to it, that then the formation of these compounds are actually 80 percent reduced. Or you you know you marinate your meat in some vinegar, so um, you can reduce a lot of those the formation of those compounds, those quote unquote harmful chemicals, by just uh, marinating your meat and then the other part of it becomes also if you eat this with some broccoli on the side or some greens or a salad or some kale you're also bringing this down so it really comes back to sort of this uh, um, synergy of eating animal and plant source foods I believe uh, which it, it kind of the opposite is kind of true to, to make it analogous to that if you eat beef and beans you actually improve the iron uptake from those beans by eating meat with it through what we call the meat factor, which is basically a fancy way of saying is that it works. We just don't know how it works. <laughs> uh, so but there's some factors in meat apparently that help with it. And and so it comes back to the sort of the, this, the synergy. So I think, you know, we, we focus on, on and I, I don't know, I, I'm guilty of it too. We focus on the difference between grass-fed and grain-fed beef. It's, it's important, these nuances to understand them, but we also sometimes have to zoom out and think like, hey, how does this actually impact our health in forms of a broad diet? Um, so in this case, marinating your meat, eating it with fruits and vegetables, eating it with spices can actually uh, benefit it. Cool. Like, like you would anyways, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, um, so. yeah I, I was just yeah. wondering because, you know, if you have linseed oil or walnut oil, it always says uh, use cold, don't cook because uh, it will get oxidized. And... Um, Apparently, in the meat, there are so much other compounds that that also protect uh, omega trees. Or 
Yeah, and it's really frying, right? If you do like, you know, use one lure and use like repeated frying, then it's really like uh, yeah. an issue. But your meat, to, to, to really get to that stage, you're, you've arguably made your meat unpalatable. So mm. it's, it is true that it happens, but um, you would have likely pulled your steak off the grill. Yeah. yeah. I think there's some really, really important points there that you're saying in a kind of a scientific way, but are basically reinforcing that, you know, traditional cultural, call it what you want to, in, indigenous, you know, practice of how we've always eaten meals and what a balanced meal is actually is really important. It's not just the nutrient. It's not just the, the thing it's the 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 whole process um really does <laughs> have concomitant you know synergistic benefits so um yeah I, I um anything else Irwin you have before I no just as a consumer this this was it and and I'm really glad to know that the more uh, plant species diversity the better the omega three ratio it, it it just all fits in the same way there for me there are no contradictions in in your research Stefan. Well, so this is... yeah, to be honest with you, it's like, you know, I sometimes feel like what we're sometimes we find something unusual, but most of what we do, I feel like, you know, like most farmers probably look at this and they're like, duh, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's so what I, I don't know, right? But, but yeah. yeah, but it's nice to have the science behind it, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and and then you go back to that, that book, right? From, from Warren Angus Ferris. And I really like that quote because then you read this and you're like, this guy already knew this 200 years ago, right? Uh, that if you put animals, if bison are on the biodiverse pasture, the meat becomes better. Uh, he, he writes it down. And so so it, it's indeed, like you said, Dan, this is a lot of this is just common sense or traditional wisdom or however you want to you wanna call it. But yeah, in, intuitively, it, it makes sense. Yeah. But what that great is it? It's it's great that intuitive wisdom is finally scientifically back supported. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but what it implies is that various bars and you know processed products and things are not that, and so we don't have those synergistic benefits with a lot of the things that people snack on, et cetera, through the day, right? I mean that's that's the that's the other point is um, that in many cases we think we're eating things that are relatively healthy but we're not getting a lot of that magic function um <clears throat> that life somehow is able to perform so yeah i've got a couple <clears throat> couple points here i want to just sort of touch on i think one 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 piece um i just talked i think it was last week to a guy named bill harris who i believe is a person who created this omega balance oh, that's right uh, um, well he created omega omega quant index okay it's 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 a similar concept yeah, well, I think, I mean, we we throw around the word omega-3, omega-6 ratio all the time, and that's sort of been like the thing that's been known for 30 or 40 years, or I mean, maybe even longer than that. Um, but there's other ways of, of characterizing it that maybe we should be starting to change our language um, and not saying omega-3, omega-6, but omega balance or omega quant or what what's your thought about that? I mean, because this, this whole project is about defining nutrient density. Yeah. And so we've collected all this data because we want to be able to say this steak is 80 out of 100, this steak is 20 out of 100. And to do that, you have to take all these nutrients and all these microbiome and everything else and 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 bring it down to like a few biomarkers, which are specific compounds and specific ratios. Yeah, that's right. So so we did uh, take your, you'll, you'll see it now when you see the paper, we did take your advice to heart and, and, and put it uh, as a red, yellow, green in the... Yep. In the, in the paper eventually. Um, the tricky part on that was, is, is that, you know, like when is something red, yellow or green, well, right? This is red starts at zero to, what we'd have is zero to 20 is red, 20 to 40 is orange, 40 to 60 is yellow. <laughs> 60 to 80, <laughs> no, yeah, dark, no, yeah. that, that's, 80 to 100 is, is dark green and everything's a data point in that. That's how we've yeah. been doing our graphs. No, I, I I agree. That that's that's yeah. we, we we took we took in that, that similar approach in the yeah. paper where we're kind of like you know sort of but it's kind of like the, you know a little bit like this of course because now we think okay is an omega six to three ratio below two much better than one that's three probably probably not in the in the broader context but but I do agree that that the omega six to three ratio and uh, for instance if if I uh, 
pop a slide up real quick here. I think yeah, we, we'll try to introduce the, the omega balance into our uh, into our paper, um, and um, uh, and and see what the what 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 this is because this really is a nice way of showing. It just shows the proportion of omega threes, the total uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So omega six and omega threes are both polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. Yeah, and and it really. Is, is maybe an easy way of showing it because as you see there, the you know, omega-6 to 3 ratio set, everything hangs out at the bottom, right? Yep. And here, this is a, allows us to get a little bit better better spread and, and sort of, it's easier for the human mind, I think, to visualize something on a zero to 100 scale. And that basically is that what that could be. If you took that 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 second green um, one above, yeah, right there, yeah. and just it pivoted it, you know, 90 degrees, that could be, that, that basically is a bell curve. Yeah, so that's, 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 you got a hundred over here, and you got one over here, and you got a bunch of things in the middle. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. And um, and granted, these ones were the ones that you know have the high omega sixty three ratio, so that's highly correlated. Yeah. So, but yeah, if you if you do that this way, you could say this is red. All this the is, all the grass feds going to be sitting pretty far in the bottom third, and uh, yeah, all, well, all yeah, the green, feds, all the green feds in the bottom third, the grass yeah. feds in forty and seventy, but there's not much grass fed that's above 70 or 80 right i mean they're so no but the, no 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 but this is quite a, quite a, like that half of your uh or 40 percent i mean 40 percent of all the so the, this is the omega-6 to 3 right essentially it's the same thing it's like when you have a ratio of about one and a half it's about 40 percent uh yeah. uh omega balance in this result but 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 my point being here is, is that yes this is a on a, on a zero to 100 scale, this is, this is good. And yeah. And, and if you look at fish, yeah, this would be higher here. Grain fed beef is lower here. Uh, most yeah. ultra processed foods fall around here. So this is another way of, of kind of like helping to visualize it on a, on a scale of one to one to a hundred. And, and as you can see here, yeah, you could make the argument that, you know, red, uh, here, orange, uh, or yellow, yeah. orange, green, very green. Yeah. No. Yeah. Anyway, so that's where we're hopefully we'll be by the end of the year is uh, <laughs> having converted these data points into something that's relatively trans, you know, a simple, a simple uh, <clears throat> number you can get, or at least one could theoretically calibrate a meter with. Yeah, yeah. I, though the scientist in me is, 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 is thinking like, if something is here in the yellow and it's just like okay. sliding below and it falls in yellow, is it, you know, this is, yeah. It is it's 48 out of 100 or it's 83 out of 100 or it's 96 out of 100. Yeah. That's how I'm envisioning it is like yeah. everything sits somewhere and everything sits somewhere. Yeah. That's, and, every, that's right. and a lot of, a lot of stuff sits below 40. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's right. Yeah. That's right. But if you have something that's 42 or 38, is the 42 materially better than 38? Probably not, but it is probably better. not now. But you got to have the cutoff somewhere. You got to have it. It's got to be, yeah. Anyway, yeah. we can bother people too much of that. But yeah. that's what I'm extremely excited about yeah. and why I've been so supporting this project for the last few years well, because we'll, we'll we see, have to, this we'll is see a big deal to pull out. Yeah. yeah. I said, we'll see what the reviewer says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's it okay with it or not, but we'll yeah. see. So one other point that you made, I think you made it a couple of times, but I think is definitely worth emphasizing. And you've, I think when we were together in Washington state earlier this year, I think you made that point to me in person. Um, the work you're doing, I think is with Green Acres um, and the, the the feeding people whole foods as opposed to processed foods. I mean, walk tell us more about that. And the implications are extremely important as far as these nuances are concerned. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So so what we what we did was we recruited. Um, I think it was about thirty six people, um, and this was a randomized crossover design. They were doing uh, about six weeks, and they were consuming. We fed them all their foods, and we. Uh, got everything from regenerative agriculture. Think of it from their nuts to the rice, to the produce, to the meat, milk, eggs, all of it came from regenerative agriculture. Then we fed them the exact same foods from conventional agriculture. So if they ate an onion from regenerative agriculture, they got an onion from conventional agriculture. They ate a steak from regenerative agriculture, they ate a steak from conventional agriculture. And they ate the exact same foods six weeks each, the same person. So this is a strong uh, uh, model because, you know, you you don't have uh, uh, any genetic or maybe large, large lifestyle difference that can impact that. So, so this allowed us to, to do that. But the important thing was we recruited middle-aged individuals 
um, between 35 and, and 65. But also we were looking at this is that, okay, we want to be representative of the of, of, of sort of, uh, you know, we wanted to recruit people that have some early signs of, of, of metabolic dysfunction, but are not, uh, ha don't have diabetes or they don't have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Basically, they're at, everyone can benefit from diet, but basically they're at a point that diet can help, but there's no real need for medical intervention at that point. So, yep. so, but, you know, people being people, and, uh, if you take the average American, the average American consumes two thirds of their calories from ultra processed foods. And this was the same with the people that we recruited. The ultra processed food intake was high. Then we put them on whole foods and their triglycerides within six weeks come in normal ranges. Their HbA1c marker of, 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 of diabetic risk drops. Uh, their cholesterol drops, everything starts to become, and this was also quite amazing that probably these, this metabolic dysfunction creeped in over 30 years and in, in six weeks, you get people pretty yeah. healthy. And, and, and irrespective of what you eat, just no standard American diet, just whole foods. And um, we did measure some inflammatory markers and in, in C-reactive protein, we see probably a small benefit for the regenerative agriculture. But the big benefit, so let's say we have like this, the benefit is this big, right? From going from the standard American diet to whole foods diet. And then you get maybe another 10, 20%, maybe if you eat regenerative agriculture. I think that's a really, really important point um, <clears throat> because there's a lot of fear and concern and, you know, this is bad and that's wrong. And, and you know, glyphosate and GMOs and um, what you're saying, it sounds like is... It's the processing of the food that is having the turning it into junk. I, I don't call it ultra processed food. I call it junk. It's the the transition from food to junk, that junk food, that is the thing that's most powerfully negatively impacting us. Um, is that, I mean, is that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the elephant that? in the room. Yeah. Okay. I, it, I just want to depends pull on, all that out. That's the elephant in the room. I do want to highlight it and I see it in the comments here. It depends on what you're measuring. And, you know, we, we will measure uh, like, like glyphosate levels in the urine and some, some pesticide markers. Um, again, it comes back to like, I, I agree then. I agree then uh, that that's probably the big elephant in the room. How does being exposed to glyphosate, having glyphosate in your urine for 30 years impact it over 30 year lifespan? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm in your gut gut and you've got probably better than not. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm not I'm not saying glyphosate's something we want to yeah. be supporting whatsoever. I'm what I'm saying is, with all the big conversation about food and health and everything else, and you know, our organization is very specifically focused on yeah. green density, which is not you know processing versus unprocessing. I mean, maybe we need to broaden the the term. Um, but yeah, this is. I just want to really emphasize that that. <clears throat> It's the whole food balanced diet, whatever the source that will have the biggest possible impact. And let's not get too, let's, let's be clear about which things we need to be prioritizing when we're choosing between products. You yeah, know, no, our, our, our between process products yeah. is about choosing whole foods instead of processed products. Yeah. Like I'm not going right. to get this organic product instead of that, or, instead of that not organic product, I'm going to get whole food instead of product. Is that yeah. Yeah, that's a super accurate statement. I agree. And like, like I said, if if uh, every fast food chain out there would start sourcing their beef and chicken from regenerative agriculture, we could we probably both agree that that may be a win, right? But if we still going to turn this into chicken nuggets and and uh, coke burgers and fries, then yeah, yeah we're, we're losing the forest for the trees for sure. Yeah, great. Just wanted to really emphasize that. Um, let me see. Um, I guess one technical point, which I think you again said, but I'm not sure if people heard what you said. Um, you were when we started this project three years ago. You thought you knew what you were doing as far as like this is the protocol for testing these nutrients in the beef, and so we tested all the beef, and then you're like, "Huh, wait a minute, um, maybe there's something more here." And so, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've sort of developed methods in the space to get this project done that are that have some significant. It's a, it's a, it is in and of itself a, a, a um, an evolution of this of the science is the methods you developed and the, the what you were saying about how these, you know, compounds get 
digested into the animal and then we become more bioavailable, the, the, the secondary metabolites. Do you want to just emphasize that, what you did and um, what its implications are? I think it's quite significant. I bet most people missed it. Yeah, I mean, not to get too too technical, but sort of, you know, let's take the, the compound, let's take uh, the name benzoic acid. And then you have a compound that is very similar to benzoic acid, but it's just not benzoic acid. It's metabolized a little bit. Um, and and what, what made this project challenging, but also this is, this is science, is that we were looking at older data, like what do we base this on? So the, the, the French and Italians had done a lot of work in this area in during the 90s and the 2000s in milk. And they're reporting these compounds in milk and uh, cheese and, and even some lamb. And they say, well, there's benzoic acid in there. But this is using older techniques. We measure benzoic acid on a new instrument and we're like, well, wait a minute. This is not in here. Whatever you guys, you know, does that make sense? And the reason why, I'm not saying that you guys were wrong, but it's a benzoic acid derivative. But the way that they measured it in the past, and this is evolution of science, is, is that they were unable to distinguish between it. So maybe a more, but this is hindsight 2020. I'm sure 20 years from now, someone will say, well, Stefan, this is, you know, like we'll have learned some stuff, right? But, yeah. but technically, technically, the, the most proper way would be saying benzoic acid derivatives. But if you measure it using all the techniques, you cannot really distinguish between it. So it just appears as like this one compound. Because if you measure sort of uh, on, a, on, a, on a spectral wavelength, you cannot resolve the difference between yeah. this. But with MS, 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 you can. Uh, but that also made me think like, hey, this, this stuff that was in there, it's actually, it's actually the metabolized version of it. So, so yeah, this made uh, the project uh, that much more complicated for sure. And it gave me some uh, sleepless nights, but uh, uh, yeah, many, many, of it. a lot of work developing that. I think, <laughs> I mean, why do, I'm not sure if you have gray hairs, you're too blonde for us to know, but if you do have, maybe a couple of them came a, from- A gray beard. A gray, it came yeah. from that work you were yeah, doing. Beard turned gray. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to start start reading out the questions from the audience here, um, and uh, feel free to, you know, I'll just I'll just well I guess we'll just start. Uh, Sue asks, um, does the photochemical drop in grain finished livestock affect their health adversely? Perhaps she had asked that question before you touched. It. I think you did. Is there a correlation between the same and antibiotics in their byproducts? Um. So it is an interesting question. Yes. I'd say there, again, there's, and this is also tells you that there have been no studies done that actually, you know, like exact same animals, we finish them out pasture, put them in the feedlot. We did that on the bison, and uh, uh, which was a very controlled study because we were work, we could work with the Turner ranches, a commercial. They both have a feedlot and a pasture system on the same ranch. And they basically split the herd at some point into pen finishing or pasture finishing. So this was a unique opportunity and yes, you are diminishing the health of the animal a bit. The, like I said, you the and you show all the hallmarks that a human would show. Let's say uh, there are two Stefans. One Stefan, my brother and I both started as interns uh, out on pasture, running all the time, and then you know eating healthy foods. And then Stefan number one got an office job and started eating junk food. And Stefan number two stayed very active. Then. Stefan, number one, starts to get issues with his glucose metabolic health. He has elevated triglycerides. He doesn't look as healthy. And and, and kind of the same thing happens with just an, with another mammal, too. So, but it's, yeah, it's a combination of the grain and the lack of activity. Yes, but I do want to highlight this, is, is that I don't want to say that that grain-fed meat is unhealthy, per se. Because we don't have no concept of, like, is the animal diseased or not? I don't think the animal is sick or anything, right? And it's like, and for us, it's also like, if I go on a junk food binger for three months, yeah, is it going to draw down my health a bit? Probably, but it's not 30 years, right? So so it's, it's, it's comparatively grass-fed yeah. beef, when you don't, animal doesn't go into the feedlot, yes, compared to the grain-fed beef, it looks a bit healthier, looks a bit more nutritious. But it doesn't mean that the grain fed beef I, is per se unhealthy. I, I, I just want to but, emphasize but that. With the, but, you know, because the, the grain finished cows had the first 12 months or more of their life 
on pasture, that would be like a healthy childhood diet. But then you showed us some data from the from the uh, the pork and the poultry, which showed ten to one, twenty to one, thirty to one, and those would be animals that basically never had a good diet. So they did live quote unquote thirty years of bad diet. So I mean, we didn't really talk about that. We haven't done any work on that yet, but it's certainly something of great interest to me. Um, do you want to talk about the? I mean, and, and even the chickens that are eating grain on you know that you have you know chicken tractors and things like that they were 10 to 1 i think is what i saw yeah i mean it, the the tricky okay. part of that is is that even with poultry right like uh managing that yeah i mean we have done tested pastures poultry and essentially i uh, to say it in a crude way uh, uh <laughs> i said it on the phone call so i'll, I'll repeat it uh but anyway this was ch chickens feeding eating corn and soy outside Right. That's that's what it was. And it's not the same as pasture chicken. That's not what we think of it. Like, OK, the animal has the ability to forage, engage in innate behavior. Right. Essentially, it's just we've definitely tested some pasture chicken samples, which to me looks like chicken outside eating grain instead of chicken inside eating grain. Which is what most of our pastured operations are doing primarily. Honestly. Yeah, so yeah. The, the, and those is a key, that's a key part. But I think with chickens, yeah, like mobile coops, indeed, and and yeah. uh, I know farmers, some farmers do it, and indeed for sure. And and but this provides, uh, yeah, an, another opportunity. But yeah, so pasture isn't pasture isn't pasture either, right? And and especially monogastrics, I agree. And um, um, hopefully we'll do some of that work in in, in the future. And, and it, it is ongoing, but we just don't have enough data points on it yet. But indeed, yeah. like really good pasture chicken versus like indeed chicken that was born and raised in a confined feeding operation, essentially, uh, that maybe never seen the day uh, the light of day, right? Or uh, you get what or I'm saying? We're not going go outside. Yeah. yeah, maybe the difference there would be larger. My based on the fatty acid ratio, yes, clearly it's like one to one to eighteen to one in the beef. It's it's very nuanced. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, my guess, my hypothesis would be that the differences are b bigger in monogastrics. Yeah. And the health implications potentially. So that's the other half of what you were saying, like eat whole foods and that's dramatically better for you. But if we're talking about pork and poultry um, that are coming from animals that only ever ate grain, um, certified organic or whatever, 80% <clears throat> of their diet, um, I think you can make a strong argument that improving that would be powerfully positive. Even if people are eating a whole foods diet, if all the animal products they're eating have Omega six, omega threes at at ten or twenty to, or thirty to one, that's got to add up over time, right? I mean, as a counterpoint to your eat whole foods point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's my gut feeling too. Then I agree. I mean, you know, the short enough it is that you can see the difference in omega uh, levels of omega threes in the people's bloods. Yeah. Um, but you're not going to develop heart disease after six weeks. But maybe after 30 years of having higher circulating levels of omega threes, in theory, that should protect you from metabolic disease or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Uh, it's just like I said, no one will develop Alzheimer's during uh, during our study. So, so I, I agree, it's a worthwhile point. Uh, and this is also how it works in science. We gotta, you know, wet the randomized controlled trials together with the epidemiological data. But yes, I would agree that if you're at circ higher circulating omega three levels in your blood. That if you do so for 30 years, then on paper, you should have uh, lived better into old age. But if you're eating an animal, animal products as part of your balanced diet, and those animal products have omega-6s that levels that are at 10 or 20 or 30 to 1, and that's a significant part of your diet, that's going to, over time, have negative impacts. Well, potentially, yeah. Whole... But that, that comes, but think back to that, like the 10, 20 percent or so. Okay. Well, that's my yeah. question. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know either. No, but that, that's that's my uh, educated uh, guess. Yeah, beautiful. All right, a few uh, questions that may be simple to answer. Um, Doug asked, is there published information around your points regarding whole foods versus processed foods? Um, Ultra Processed People is a book that came out recently I keep hearing about. Oh, uh, that sounds like a good, uh, a good Ultra book. Ultra Processed People, I think it was a Brazilian author. Um, everywhere I'm traveling in Europe, people are talking about it. Um, I think it's, but um, I think that's based pretty well in the literature. Yeah. So, so um, the the peer reviewed paper is not is is not out yet. That one's in in uh, uh, not not your paper. 
he's asking if there's other papers you can refer oh, to. Oh, published information, information, yes. Yes. Um, more I have a reason to say because we did a whole foods versus processed food diet mm -hmm. also uh, uh, recently. Yeah. But but uh, yes, there's been, well, there's seminal work from like Kevin Hall, that's a researcher at uh, the NIH, and he did a two week diet. Um, if people, if you give people ultra processed foods, they eat 500 calories more, probably because it's not as satiating, it's more palatable. Um, and um, it turns out people eat more and therefore they get uh, gain weight and their blood markers uh, get worse already after two weeks. And what's the name of that researcher? Uh, Kevin Hull. Kevin Hull, H-U-L-L? -L? Yeah, yes. Perfect. Kevin Hull. All right, uh, Jennifer asks, um, is there a lab where I can get some ribeye sample that I can compare to your results? I'm raising rare breed beef and wanting to find out if they are special or not, quote unquote special. Thank you for making a very complex topic accessible. I think the answer is- uh, Yeah, I mean, that. if she sends me an email, we could we could potentially help her with that. And your email is in the slides there. Yeah, already uh, Google me, Stefan yeah. Van Vliet, Utah State, and uh, people, people, yeah. <laughs> it's available. People tend to even find your cell phone number sometimes, so that's quite <laughs> amazing. But which is fine. I always love to yeah. talk to the farmer, so. Um, uh, but, cool. yeah. What's that? No, that, that was it. Yeah, I, I was going to ask her, answer her second question as well. Go for it. Yeah. Was the corn GMO or non-GMO? Um, I don't know if it was non-GMO, but I, I don't think that would have impacted the fatty acid ratio as much. It would just be the exposure to glyphosate of the animals. But uh, again, there it's the animal provides quite a good buffer against pesticides. So it, the pesticide residue in animal source food is not that high Interesting. Uh, as, 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 as a silver lining. As opposed to things like wheat and soy. Yeah, and direct the, consumption, yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's right. Um, Godfrey has a couple of good questions here. Do you wanna just read those and answer them or I can read them out loud? Um, now that grain has more omega-6, does it mean when we consume boiled maize and beans, we are adding more omega-6 to our bodies? Um, um, yes, that's, that's what it means. But if in traditional cultures, we often sprouted and fermented these things and it actually decreases the omega sixes and increases the omega threes. So it does mean that, but if balanced with, like I said, it's not like omega six is evil. Omega three is good. If you eat a ton of omega threes, you'll get problems with blood clotting and things such as that. If you don't eat any omega sixes, you also run into issues. So, but yeah, you want to balance that, I, I see. But the problem of the, the standard Western diet is, is that, remember, we, we the, it, the diet was about four to one. So we, are, we used to consume four times more omega, for every molecule, four molecules of omega six, we consume one omega three. But now for every, uh, we consume 20 molecules of omega six for every one omega three. And that's really the problem. Just the ratio. Yeah, yeah, just the ratio. So if you eat some fish with it, for instance, or some grass-fed beef with your beans, I think you're uh, you're well, uh, you're 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 good. Yeah, but I think seeds and seed oils. I and mean, oftentimes people are cooking with seed oils. Things are being fried in seed oils. Those have very very high levels. That's something we want to be removing from the diet to a large degree. Yeah, that's right. And 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 switch it out with the uh, indeed other other uh, things such as maybe yeah. uh, you know, flax, yeah. which you don't already cook with, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, for the case of pigs, I thought it was an omnivore, but can see their pastured pork. Um, kindly elaborate on this. And from the presentation, pasture has more omega three. That's the case. Doesn't that mean that pigs should be fed exclusively on diversified diversified pasture? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yes. Well, I mean, the short, the, the sort of the nature of it is is also is is that the current breeds of poultry and pigs, right? They they do very well on grain, so this becomes like sort of this bigger picture issue where different breeds might do better on 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 pasture, and I think many of the farmers can attest to it way better than I do, and probably you can, that. But some some breeds of pigs can do well on on pasture, whereas maybe more generic breeds, yeah, they're so adapted to eating grains that uh, that that most pigs will need some sort of grain to uh, to put on weight. But what some farmers do, they look at alternative, like indeed grains that are not as high in omega-6s, that are richer in these phytochemicals, uh, which could be indeed wheat, 
peas, barley, maybe some flax meal uh, instead of our, you know, conventional corn and soy. So it's, but then it becomes a consideration. I can appreciate too, the cost of course involved is the consumer willing to pay for that if when educated. Yeah, these are. Well, I think, I mean, we had Ken Hamilton on who is a close neighbor of yours. I'm not sure if you've met him yet. I would hope, hope at some point to facilitate that relationship. <clears throat> he was, he's been doing a lot of work with sprouting and then yeah. fermenting grains as yeah. fodder for chickens and pigs and other, other animals. And um, been seeing a decreased cost of production for the producer. So it is not a more expensive that using, I think he's using sort of conventional breeds, um, both layers and, and meat birds and, and, and hogs. And, um, and through that taking different grains, but then sprouting and then fermenting them, um, having a decreased cost of production, uh, dramatically improved omega six, omega three ratios, um, you know, uh, less death, uh, you know, all kinds of not susceptible to, to, um, influenzas and stuff like that, bird flu and, and, um, whatever it is, eat this, I can't remember what it's called, the, eat, um, there was an influenza that went around with, with pigs a little yeah. while. Anyway. Yeah. So I think that, that would be the answer, Godfrey, is that you would want to be having, um, pigs, you know, putting together a, 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 a fodder regimen that's more balanced and it looks like from Ken's work, it can be more economical. It's easier for the animal to digest. They get better weight gain. And um, then therefore you have less cost of, of food to purchase. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me see. Uh, John, hello. What relationship is there in terms of the animal's growth rates and high omega-6 ratio? I guess maybe I kind of touched on that. Yeah. You know, this is, this is, is a good, it's, it, it's a good question. It's like, you know, Oftentimes you get into the question and it's like, okay, uh, if you put animals on, on lots of grains, yeah. it gains weight. It goes finishing weight to finishing weight faster. But the question is, is that quality weight or are you just putting on weight for the sake of weight, right? That, uh, and, and to an extent, that is what's happening. You're, it, it is literally fattening an animal up. Um, so... Um, you know, and this is an important consideration. So yeah, you could decrease the finishing time on that, right? And I know I'm, I'm diverting a little bit, but let's bring it back to humans. Let's say uh, I have a brother and the goal of us, both of us is to get to 200 pounds by, the, by uh, a certain age. Yeah, I can, you know, I can get myself to 200 pounds by the age of 12, right? Instead of 18, <clears throat> if, if I uh, eat a bunch of ultra processed foods. So uh, is that better? Is it that becomes a, a quality? So I think it's not so much the high omega six ratio that that causes it, but it's just an indicator of okay, the animals are eating more grains, right, and therefore more exposed to omega sixes. So that's why, arguably, there's that that correlation. But it's it's not so much the, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if the omega six feeding per se, and then more of like just a high grain feeding and fattening the animal up. Yeah, I, I think I, I would agree. From from what Ken's work seems to suggest, you can support animals in gaining weight fast from a healthy diet. Yeah. Um, it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't it have comes, to high Yeah, this comes back also to a farmer we work with uh, in Alder Spring Ranch who grazes animals on very biodiverse mountain pastures up here in Idaho, and he puts weight on fairly fast. And the reason is because they're on high quality forages. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you can emulate it because uh, indeed, if I eat very healthy and uh, do some exercise, right, I could also get to 200 pounds, but probably a little <laughs> bit healthier. A different different kind of weight yeah that's right no but this is how it is i i want to i want to really emphasize this point is is that you know cows and bison is just another mammal right we are just another mammal it's it, it's not not that special not that complicated we know intuitively you know we do to the animals we do to us as well i mean this is this is how it is and the metabolism is not all that different um so Intuitively, you know, like if I stuff myself full of, of uh, uh, certain foods that, yeah, this is not ideal, right? <laughs> not that different for an animal. You see all the same hallmarks of metabolism. It's So that, I think, is the way to think about it. And maybe that's the way for us, maybe as humans, to think about it as well, is, is that just think of the animal as your, your child or something like that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And then, and then it's sort of like, and think of it as like, okay, if, if I do this to myself and I do this to the animal, you see similar parallels. So healthy, di healthier diet, healthier weight gain, healthier animal, more nutritious food. Yeah. So. When I teach my courses talking about plants, I say, you know, germination is birth, you know, uh, <laughs> kindergarten is when you're being transplanted out. Uh, puberty is, is first flowering and fruit set. Like this are, if you understand these life cycles in humans, you can actually begin to see what's going on in the plant and and be more attuned to what its needs are. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. If you starve a plant of, of nutrients and water, it doesn't do that yeah. well, right? It's not the same. It's the same as human. An IV, an IV drip is fertilizer, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that matter, but, but it makes it makes yeah. total sense, though, right? Like, and yeah, I think yeah. even in plants, you could argue that this is the way to view it. I, I that's yeah. yeah exactly how I frame it for people. It really helps. I think, yeah. Great. Um, um, Peter asks, uh, what what's what what's the comparison of omega three in concentrate and omega three in green plants? Yeah, it varies, of course, but yep. So the 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 difference is that roughly, um, if you look at forage like TMR, like in concentrate, I'm looking at the screen because I have the data here, but it's about uh, uh, five ten percent omega threes, and then in forage. In green plants, it's about 50% omega-3s. So it's about 10 times higher, um, which you get a sort of a little bit of a watering down effect in the animals, right? But it's five times higher there in the animals. So this comes back to the fact that, yeah, green forage is really uh, what, uh, what, what is really driving it. I had another interesting question that uh, I was presenting at a bison conference two days ago, and one farmer brought up the point and he said, well, what if you feed green forages or green feed, right? Hey, exclusively in a feedlot, what does that do to the omega-63 profile? And why did you have the treatment? And I was like, that's brilliant. We should have had that treatment. Then think of it because, yeah. because no one really does that, right? Well, that's, and that's, I mean, if you, again, go back to Ken Hamilton's work, if you yeah. took, if you fermented hay properly and fed it in feedlots, you could get a lot of the beneficial impacts. I I, I think you know, so. You yeah. could totally yeah. do it, and it might be, you know, you know, no vaccines, no antibiotics. You wouldn't need any of that stuff. You less death, you know, um, you know, a better manure, you know, like less 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 stinky, less negative impacts on the environment by just shifting the nature of the diet of the animals. Right. I mean, you could still you could do this on industrial scale to significant benefit. Yeah, I, I agree. And and maybe there's something to be said in the feedlot ration to eat a little, eat, eat some more forage. We've seen this in the bison. And, and he was saying like, well, I do that. I am uh, I don't have the, the land to support all the bison. We do rotationally grazing, but I have a finishing herd for like 60 days that I put in a dry lot and I feed them some some green feed, some hay. Yeah. And and he said, well, does that do for the fatty acids? And I was like, I don't know, but it probably looked pretty similar to the pastured animals yeah. in terms of fatty acids. Maybe you don't get the depth of phytochemicals, be my hypothesis, but I'd, I'd say probably you get a similar profile, which is actually, uh, uh, yeah, which is a key part. So, so and, and that also comes back to sort of the realistic approach that we have to take is that, yeah, you know, like um, maybe, you know, like, we we I like to put it as like grass finished, grain finished, the feedlot, pasture, etc. But you know, like there's some nuances within both, and maybe yeah, there's some you know some improvements to be made in both systems, and 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 it's also very likely, and maybe uh, you know I don't want to offend anyone, and and maybe it sounds controversial, but I consider it very likely that we will have both pasture systems and feedlot finished systems in the near future. That are doing a very good job. That I hope so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so, and uh, oh, then uh, we will have both. That, yeah, we will have both. Yes. Yeah. So, it would be they're not going to be disappearing. So, yeah. let's figure out how to do well with them, is your point. I, I that I agree. And, 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 yeah. and, and there is some interest, I, I think, especially from uh, uh, bigger industry also. It's like, okay, you know, like, what if we give indoor outdoor access to the chickens? What if we give different feeds to the chickens? What, you know, can we find, can we take sort of, this what you see on the past, but can we can we at least like you know make yes. incremental changes within a sort of a, a conventional system? And I think yeah, that, that's key. Dramatic, dramatic changes. Yeah, positive changes. The bar yeah. is really low right now, so it wouldn't take much to do, you know, to significantly better. I think 
but I mean, that's just, what do I know? I'm not a scientist. No, I, I agree, Dan. You can bring <laughs> a, the, the triester ratio from chicken down to 18 to 10 or eight, just by making a few changes in your feet, in your, in your confined feeding system. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Um, let me see. Henry asks for, for more about human health and animal health re glyphosate. I'm not sure. I think we touched on that. I'm not sure if there's anything else that you do. You know much about? Yeah, whether whether the glyphosate would, uh, yeah. What's no. the effect of glyphosate on human and animal health? I'm presuming is what he's asking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's generally it's negative. It's it's so, a yeah. Yeah, there is this, this is the thing. There's, there's not been a ton of work in that area that is that has been uh, done. Um, there's not a ton of work that's done in that area, unfortunately. There's some work. To, here's the work that has been done on this. It's, if you feed people a diet from organic agriculture, it doesn't have to be regenerative organic, but organic, right? There have been studies done, especially in children, because there's sort of a, a bigger concern, is within a week or two, you cannot detect any pesticide residue in their urine. Um, Is that a benefit? I mean, intuitively you think yes, but you also have to be realistic. None of there's no children dying from low systemic pesticide exposure in most Western society, arguably, right? Not acute death, at least, right? You could the question then becomes, what does it mean if you're exposed to that for 60 years? And 30 or 40 or 500 or 5,000 other chemicals in our <laughs> in our lives that are it's not just any one thing you can't really yeah, yeah that, that's thing. right it's 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 probably it's even not just glyphosate but it's a whole cocktail of uh, of things and there's some interesting work in animals to suggest that yeah maybe you know giving glyphosate is not as bad but giving a bunch of other uh pesticides in sort of a cocktail gets this synergistic effect the the wrong kind of synergy that you want essentially right it's the synergy we talked about with the phytochemicals and the fatty acids or you yeah. get some negative synergy if you mix certain things there's some organ animals but again it's like usually with high doses so it's it's a really difficult question to uh to to answer as a scientist i have to be careful that i as don't... a scientist to be able to say categorically black and white complete you can't say much but from an intuitive standpoint it's not that kind yeah of i mean i do, do do i think it's better if you don't if you're not peeing out pesticides your entire life yes it's not in your what? blood system constantly flowing. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, but I don't know what the, what the uh, long term uh, implications of that are. Yeah. All right, we got four minutes left. I'll try to do a couple more. Sue, um, antimicrobial resistance is becoming a global concern. Have you seen any trends or relationships across production systems and livestock species related to the same? <clears throat> I think that. Yeah. Uh, no. It's, resistance it's, in animals, farm animals. Yeah, it's it's not uh, something we like is per se our. Uh, our, our, our uh, bread and butter or something that we uh, that, that that we do that we look at per se we you know we, we did make an interesting observation in a paper is I think pretty close to being accepted we we, we sent it in uh, last year and so that tells you something about the peer review process it's it's I think it will come out this year um, but my point being is is that we did find some veterinary drug residue in in in, in meat it turns out that it wasn't the farmer giving it, but it was the distiller's grains that were causing that. So, so do you, and you see a little bit in there. So yeah, you might see some antimicrobials in there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there has been, this is a, in sort of a theoretical concern. Yeah, maybe like antibiotic residue exposure through meat. Yeah, it could be a problem over time. Yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah. I mean, there's, there's that concern, yeah. You're not aware of anything specifically, but that does not mean it's not necessarily. Yeah, it's not like like you know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, it there's a there's papers on it, but it it speaks more of like the what we a lot of things that we talk about like theorizing, the, you know, theoretical approach like hey, uh, kind of like you know the pesticide work where yeah okay many studies that suggest that eating organic produce you don't pee out pesticides and then it's kind of like well in animals. This is what is the effect and anti-inflammatory and it alters things. And, but it's kind of like, you know, coming, making recommendations based on that. So. Yep. Cool. Um, Doug Bradley says, thanks much. I'll be watching for your work when it comes out. Anonymous attendee says, I learned something valuable today. Although I'm a lacto vegetarian, I now understand how to improve the quality of products derived from animals. This knowledge is quite relatable. 
cows are a reflection of what they eat. And in turn, the quality of animal products we consume is directly influenced by their diet. Good. Good. I hope that those kind of <laughs> points are the basic points here. But um, yeah, great. Um, any 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 last comments or or uh, or thoughts you'd like to leave us with, Stefan? No, I mean thank you for the for the for the opportunity, Dan, and 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 the support for this work. Also, thank you for all the farmers that have participated in this. I I know we uh, it was a long a long journey, so so I appreciate that, and I think you know we are contributing to something to the greater good for sure. Uh, and and this is a growing movement, and yeah, I'm I'm happy to be. Uh, uh, it's a small part of, of of researching that, and I'm often finding out that uh, indeed what the farmer suggests uh, turns out to oftentimes be the case, and that's 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 kind of yeah, that, that, that's that's uh, that's good. So well, hopefully, sometimes we find something that's like uh, kind of surprising. So, or just thank you very much for being the scientist who's willing to engage the complex process of figuring out whether what we already always thought we knew was actually true, because a lot of these things are like, you know, common sense, but not supported in the scientific realm. And so that really has powerfully negative impacts because we don't actually have the science to prove what we think we already know. And so yeah. I think it's really, really powerful what you've been doing and and really appreciate your your leadership in the space. Um, yeah, it's uh, a thank you. I thank you very much. So oh. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, we'll see you again next week. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat>